idea behind it, how it came about? This was a project by the government of India. There was a secretary of, in the Ministry of Information Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was in his mind. But he actually felt that it is important for what he perceived as serious filmmakers saying what they had to say about India in 50 years. So five filmmakers were selected. One was Sham Benegal, Girish Karnad, Buddhadev Das Gupta in Bengal, myself, God, and the fifth I, right now I can't recall, but I didn't know what they had in mind, the other five, or the other four. But I had been traveling for some time in various parts of southern India and uh, I felt that this is an opportunity of, of traveling across the land and to be able to judge for myself and not necessarily for the government of India but for myself to be able to document ordinary people and travel. So for me it was like a, a wish come true and somebody was paying for it. Yeah. So you know, it's important to be able to realize that there is money there. So I did that and I said I'll travel. So with a crew of about 16 people, we started traveling in four vehicles and we covered India. But I must clarify here that I didn't know what to expect, nor did I have any kind of fixed plan in my mind as to the kind of question that I, that I want to ask or the feedback that I will get. There was no grand plan at all. But I believe that if I get a certain kind of response, it will lead me onto, onto further journeys rather than, you know, have a journey of my own in my mind. So that's what I did. So I traveled and I shot and I, it was incredibly the amount of material that we had. And also that the government even suddenly said there are 13 parts. I said, I don't have 13, I can give you 50, you know. And they thought I'm going to charge more money for that. I said, no, 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 all, it's all, you know, I can give you 50 uh, 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 episodes. So finally they said, no, you bring it down to 16 and the problem became, how do you, how do you reduce the enormous amount of, 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 of material? And not just the material, it's the people that you've met and their, their dignity that you are, you're, you're, you're going to, you're going to uh, you know, play games with to reduce all this material into 16 episodes. And to me it is a frightening exercise because you know that the person who you are speaking to you know, has so much more to offer if only you have time to listen. So you, what we, we were doing was actually savaging their, their, their world views and their ways of expressing into 16 episodes. So it was a very difficult and very traumatic experience for me to reduce people and their faith that they had in me, in our team, yeah. it was just compressed them into 16 episodes. So therefore it became a little scatological in a sense, provided of course in the, in the back of my mind was alright, maybe if the theme can continue, yeah. you know, if you get the essence of what is being said, simultaneously at the back of my mind I also required to be able to see terrain, to mix in terrain to mix in an environment, to mix in a space, you know. But when you combine all that into, I don't know how many hours of, I think we've left all the material here, uh, hours of people talking, it became a very difficult exercise. And from a very selfish point of view, I felt it changed my life actually. It actually changed my life because suddenly you were confronted with the dignity of ordinary people and their humor and their, I don't know, it was a, and their generosity. And here you are, uh, so-called 
well-known filmmaker with a certain kind of media baggage backed up and then you've got a team of people going into villages, equipment being hauled out and you have this incredible sense of arrogance. You know, and you shove a mic into somebody's face and say, tell me, or something, you know. It's, it's very frightening. But that changed over time and suddenly you realize that, damn it, you're the learner now. You're the learner and they are the experts and then suddenly it changes, the whole relationship changes around, you know, in a, in a strange way. So that was wonderful, really, for me. So your approach to have changed uh, as you went through, because you started out in Bombay, and, right. started, and then you went... You went down south, yeah. and you know, Maharashtra, and then Karnataka, and then to yeah. Kerala, then Tamil Nadu, and then into central India, then into the northeast, and the northeast, and into UP and Bihar, into Kashmir, Ladakh, and you know, uh, yeah. But I must tell you that was that one experience of mine. I mean, I was traveling a lot earlier. Made me do several journeys after that, just like that, and just for myself. I did a journey in 1998. I did a journey in 2002. I did a journey in 2005. Ah, post, post, post this journey. And each time I, tra I don't think there's anybody who's traveled more in India than I have. Not even, not even a politician. I mean, and, and I know what the reason for that. But I really, I think, <coughs> and it's not too. Sh is, there's a physical, there's a physicalness of traveling, and I've traveled by road, and I've traveled. I've tried to avoid highway, highways. That's the reason I've got a back problem. That's the reason I've got this cushion behind my back right now, because I travel so much, and I. Uh, it's, it's been uh, an incredible experience, an incredible experience of just shaking a hand, sharing a meal and a conversation and traveling on. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. So, I mean, this idea of stress for the people of India obviously links back to Nehru's stress for destiny. Mm. It was mm. supposed to be kind of a uh, reflection back on that, right, right 15 right. years. So, I mean, in terms of that, I mean, uh, what was your experience actually looking at the no, one is you have dreams. You have dreams of, 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 of certain visionaries who are become leaders of a country, you know, and uh, you have dreams of a, of a nation. You have dreams, of, dreams about <coughs> a constitution. You, you have dreams about what a people can become <coughs> over time. And then what you have is an actual reality of people. And uh, there's a contradiction between the two. You know, and uh, in that is, I think, the dialectic. In, in fact, in that, I think, is the crux of uh, where we're coming from and where are we going. Yeah. You know, and that is so critically important. You know, I'm absolutely unamazed about, say, uh, the violence of the Gujars in, 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 in Rajasthan. I'm absolutely unamazed with the rise of the Naxalites. Of the I'm, I'm completely. Uh, I'm not shocked at all, you know, and I know the violence that's occurring across the land. I, I can, it doesn't shock me, because I know it is, it was always there. It was always just below the surface, you know, and uh, I'm not amazed. The point is, the people who say that they want to govern, I don't know what they mean by governance. I have no idea because I think they are at sea with the concept of what is governance really all about. And fundamentally it's got to do with people. It is not, it is not the infrastructure, the highways, of course they are important, I'm not denying that, or the railway system being on time, or whatever else in terms of the paraphernalia that goes around along with development, but the point they seem to miss is a, an eye contact with people. And that's where they lose out. And when they lose out, they lose out terribly. And they misconstrue. They know that they're actually looking at 
the leaves without seeing the tree. वो पेड़ नजर नहीं आ रहा उनको दे ना वो दरख्त नहीं नजर नहीं आ रहा है एंड दस अ पैटर्न टू इट एक्चुअली एंड यू रियलाइज दिस वेन यू ट्रेवल्ड even a pattern the, i think the pattern is a, is a distancing from people there's a distancing of, of the entire ruling elite doesn't matter which bloody party it is from and what they have as their contact with people are i think fundamentally strong troopers and the strong troopers are never people so all you have are legions of strong troopers depending on which party you belong to legions of strong troopers carrying the political will of a political party as opposed to the will of the people which is beyond storm troopers beyond political parties you know what i'm saying yeah. and there is a will yeah. which has never been defined or never been understood and they are not i don't i i think nobody by and large i we never understand that a trust has been placed a trust by the people when they vote every 5 years or depending on a by election or whatever else there's a trust being placed and now what's happened is this incredible inconsequence of the of the ballot it is so unimportant because now it manifests itself in terms of regime change because they happen to be part in the next and the next and the next and the, it doesn't matter beyond ideology now beyond ideology it doesn't matter now so we go through this act of voting but they don't realize that that vote now is a loss of faith it's no longer an assertion of faith a vote should be an assertion of faith it has now become a loss of faith across the land and that's the problem so it's kind of a failure of governance but it's also across the board failure of the vision of uh, and you can see a vision collapse because all said and done uh, i don't know it's um, you know a government report that says uh, what is it the national commission of unemployment recently they put, about 5 6 months ago they put up figures of uh, 77% of people being i don't know below some ridiculous amount of money that they earn uh, that in other words 77% of indians earn less than 26 rupees a day or something like that at a per capita level that is not an indication of anything actually it in in some sense it is but in that another sense it's not it's not that that i'm talking about of course there's poverty we all know there's poverty around it and in, incredibly high and and, and vicious and and, and it, it it eats at the vulnerable the most vulnerable the most marginalized but that's not the issue actually i think the issue is when you lose that faith you when that faith is lost something else is going to happen and that kind of friction i don't know what form it will take at one level you can have the gurjars demanding us to be part of the scheduled trap because but the meena will say no because we got 9% and these guys will take away from us what is the battle about if you take this concept of reservations how many jobs does it employ anywhere across india pathetic it's pathetic if you take the numbers involved it's pathetic that's not the, so what is the war what is the battle is it for that I don't think so. I think if you take reservations across the board, what would it, what would it mean in terms of sheer numbers? A million people, maximum to the uh, at the outer limit. Yeah. That's it. So what what do you you know what is it? You mean talking about a billion people now? What is what is the battle? it's not that somewhere else there's angst and what is it you got to figure out and i i know that i have the answers i'm not suggesting that i've got the answer but i think 
for people who happen to be in the when they say they are in governance and they have the power to deliver something when that is becomes questionable as a problem you know uh, it's like saying you know uh, it's not that the poor are poor what's happened is that they've lost their dignity and that's critical that's critical so when you try to regain it what form will it take It's not just the thing of not having enough to eat or whatever. That's of course it's and it's terrifying if they're poor. But when your dignity as a human being gets reduced, there's hell to pay. And that's what this governance has done to people. And that's terrifying. <coughs> yeah. And even now, it's not just now. I'm not. It's not just 1995, six that I was doing. It. Hell, I've been doing that since 2005. Yeah. So it's not that it's outdated. My my data is not outdated in that sense. You know, I mean, you 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 got to see it now. It's on this. It's on. The, it's in your face. Things might have got worse. Yeah. In a sense, perhaps it has because, <coughs> and it's. We mistake, I don't know, we mistake a glass and chrome structure in a, in, a, in a forgotten outpost as a form. And a, a lovely little petrol pump on a highway as a form of saying, look. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with even a perception of the image, of the visual that you have in mind. I'm not suggesting that it's right or wrong, that to me it's unimportant. But the perception that it is bringing about a so-called change, I think is questionable. It's questionable. The fact that we produce, a, I don't know, 10 lakh cars a year now, incredible. But we actually perceive that as a barometer to judge. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. So I mean you're definitely in all your travels you're talking about this failure of the idea of development, right? Failure of the governments. All the symbols and images that the yeah, state kind yeah. of uh, brought forward. But what about when you've been traveling all around, what about this idea of, like, say, this whole pan-Indian that travel through? Did you see that, is there something like a pan-Indian identity? Because that's been under question, obviously. So. Sometimes you sense it. But sometimes you also sense that just below the surface, this vision is a very fragile and vulnerable image. Uh, what is this MNS stuff that's happening today in India, in Bombay? <clears throat> what is it? What is Pan Indian about it? Suddenly you realize, uh, you can see the, the chinks, you can see the shafts of, 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 of the, uh, the, the chasms. But the reason that it's occurring here is primarily because I think is that this is uh, the bloody golden goose or whatever the bloody goose that you raise, raise, lays the wretched golden eggs or something and therefore, therefore to keep, uh, keep, to keep people out of this space 
not realizing that the space was built up as it bleached out, it actually bleached and leached the rest of the country into, into bled it dry and here you've got this massive, wonderful oasis called Mumbai or Delhi or, and Gurgaon and Coimbatore and, and, and you've got Ahmedabad and Pune. And, but what has it done? To the, it's actually you can see it like a bleach out in films that you take the color out of an image <coughs> And here you've got this multi-technicolor space. And even within the technicolor space, within this great surge of, I don't know what, utopia. This see, look at the spaces around this utopia. Within this utopia, look at the, look at the, uh, oof, the, 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 the dynamics of a city. Look at the, look at the, the squalor, look at the, look at the, look at the anger, look at the, it's all happening here. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. I'll have a biscuit. Go ahead. <laughs> Can I have another cup of tea, please? Sir. You see, you must talk about urban violence also. Yeah. Talk about the rural anger, but you uh, also touched upon this urban violence. Huh? And I think it's going to get. I think it's going to get worse. Everyone talks about the <coughs> MNS as an organization. Does anybody know? that the MNS at its when it's dark and in the night from the back door who enters the MNS premises you got the Congress party there the NCP there you got the Shiv Sena there you got the BJP there and they link up now this and you know don't be Alice Man, this is true this is true now, so what is MNS? Is it really MNS as MNS as we see it as like one specific organization led by one wretched uh, 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 young thug? No, it's not. It is linked. And the stakes that are going in simultaneously. We've got to be run by warlords. This city is run by warlords. And this is a fact. This is a city run by bloody warlords. Underworld, underworld. <laughs> what is the overworld? For God's sake, have a look at the overworld. Look at your. I mean, there was a chief minister who should have been in jail. He's, he's there for murder. He's up there. He's a chief. The deputy chief minister has been put be hung. He's a deputy chief. This is these are facts. Does anybody talk about it? We talk about Lalu Prasad Yadav because it's so safe. The guy doesn't retaliate. And, it's like and he jokes and he laughs. But look at the state of so-called where the money lies. Yeah. Who runs it? Yeah. And they've all become legitimate. Yeah. And they, all, they have institutions. Academics. They've got stadia named after them. Incredible. What a bunch. What a bunch. And that's governance. Now what do you do? I smoke a cigarette and I travel. And I, <laughs> I live in Goa. I write a book. Are you in Goa now? Yeah, I live much more in Goa than here. Okay. But uh, what about Kashmir? When you travel there, what is it's it? It's a very sad land. A lot of sadness. And what's happened actually in the process is that Everybody's played their game out over there. You know, it's like the, the great game being played out. And it's Pakistan, I'm absolutely sure. I'm sure China's playing a bloody game out there. Uh, the, the Kashmiri people themselves over there, you've got the Indian Army, you've got our bloody intelligence agencies playing their games out there. You've got the Pakistan bloody intelligence agencies playing their game out there. I'm sure there's 
an, uh, an American connection somewhere in the wretched deal. No. Right, wrong, good, bad, who the hell knows but? There's only one truth beyond this wretchedness of things. And the only truth that actually exists are the Kashmiri people. Whether they are Hindus or whether they are Muslims or whether they are Buddhists as in Ladakh. And they paid a price. They all have paid a price. And it's terrifying. What a price to be paid by a great game being played out by God knows whom. Yeah. And it's called strategic interests. This, these fellows who, you know, who, who write, who these thinkers who have these think tanks, yeah. they, should be took, you know, they should all be bloody hung, you know. Because they are all called strategic thinkers and they all have these so-called interests of the various nations, governments, and whatever in mind, etc. And they sit in rooms and they plan out scenarios of a world and of states and of people. Whipped. They should all be bloody whipped. <laughs> Quite honestly, they should all be bloody whipped and cut the bloody wretched nonsense out as people. Let's talk about people. And if you reach out to people, I promise you, you see what happens, it's, you know, I've always felt, like I made a statement a long time ago, like this entire state of Israel is called, <clears throat> there's a huge mythology around the state of Israel, why shouldn't they have a mythology? They've been through hell as a people. Fact, no question. Historically, they've been through bloody hell. Now, a state is born, which is called a Zionist state, and it's predominantly Jewish. All right. But now, what is the myth that goes along with it? One is, the myth is that, thank you, this land is mine, God gave this land to me. I'm sorry, Bhagwan ko kyun leya beech mein yaar? Magar Bhagwan ko leke aya beech mein. God gave this land to me. All right, it's a your God. What about the gods of the Christians and the, and, and the Muslims and the Armenians and the other guys? What about their gods? So the, that's removed. But the bigger myth yeah. is to say never again. It's the underlying raison d'etre. Never again is an idea which said never again should the Jewish people be subjected to the kind of humiliation and, and savagery at the time of the Holocaust. So the word never again becomes a word and a phrase. It's a wonderful word. I love it for a very simple reason because now let's use this word never again. When you say never again for the Jewish people, I'm absolutely on your side. But let's extend the logic. If you say never again for all people, you'll reach poetry. You reach poetry, and then poetry is the answer to your damn problem. But who's thinking of poetry? You think of very national interests. The problem is poetry, and I think that's where the answer lies. Too many bloody hard, you know, I don't know, those strategic thinkers and very, very few poets. I thought Obama was a bloody poet, but look where he ended up with this speech last night, you know. But, you know, you felt, you felt that, I think poetry is the answer, and the people dismiss poetry as some kind of stupid, idyllic, uh, keep it aside, because it's, there's a real world and there's an unreal, poetry is the unreal world. I don't think so. Yeah, it's, uh, I think poetry is very much part of the real world, and what's been removed from the lives of people is, their, is the poetry of their, of their dignity, and that's been taken away from them. And that's the problem. Samuel Huntington versus Violet. That's the problem. Huntington rules. Bring on Ghalib. <laughs> he wouldn't have. It's impossible. That's why he's, he's unburdened by history or intelligence. He's unburdened by history or intelligence. So he's a free man, but 
look where he ends up. He ends up. He's, he, these are the guys who create wars. These are the guys who divide people. Who do divide people according to race, language, religion, culture, civilization. They divide. Color of skin. Film has no role in this. I mean, people have. Well, what role does? I think film has a film has a role in terms of. I think, I think it has a role in terms of documenting. Documenting. Uh, a, 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 a state of affairs. At times, <coughs> it can reach. I think a level of poetry in which, say, uh, say, if you take the work of, say, a man like, the, say, Tarkovsky, you know, uh, uh, if you see a Tarkovsky's work, or you see, if you see sometimes a Ray's uh, uh, work, there was a, a filmmaker called Arvindan uh, in the South who was uh, one of his films. Incredibly, yes, it's possible, but to expect cinema to go beyond into 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 change, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. It can, I think, at one level, document at one level. It might, it might, it might help in in uh, sensitizing people to perhaps issues, provided, of course, it gets a, a, a mass distribution or comes on television to help. It can help at that level. But sometimes I also wonder about that. Maybe I've turned cynical, and maybe I've turned, I don't know. So. But I mean, the kinds of films that you've made, I mean, you've worked across, I mean, you've made... I was another like person, and then I started traveling. Oh, was this before you started traveling? Yeah, then I started traveling, and then when I started <laughs> traveling, I realized, no, quite honestly, he says, you started traveling, okay. and it changes you. It changes your perception. I was, a, I was a, at times, and I still am, in my soul, I know I, know I am uh, uh, radical of sorts. <laughs> but I do know my radicalness comes from uh, the books and the thought process of, of my mind. <clears throat> it doesn't come from experience of it. When people get that experience, something else is going to happen. I come from a privileged situation. It's privileged. And in that, I can, by the fact that I've read a lot and traveled, I can I can, I, can, I can go through a thought process. It's never a lived experience. There's a difference in that. The lived experience are the, are, I think, the, are the not slides. The lived experience is the, is the, the Gujar, not the leader of the Gujar, but a Gujar on the street there, you know. Those are lived experiences and there's something else can happen over there and I think that's where the, the answer lies. Not you started out making films when you made, you know, Adipin to Mother's and all those films. Why, I mean, you had a different approach than you would say. You had a different idea of what films would be. Yeah, we thought we could change the world. We're not just filmmakers. You must remember the times. You must remember the times because the times there was a world up in flames because you guys are very young. There was a world up in flames. You had liberation movements across Africa, Latin America, the Vietnam War. You had incredible, the Black Panther movement. You had uh, the Naxalites being born here. You had the Dalit writers in India, uh, poetry of, of the Dalits in India. But there was incredible stuff happening across the world. Who were your heroes? Who were I called Namdev Dasar and, uh, and Amy Cezaire and Che Guevara and Ho Chi Minh. So we were internationalists to that extent. You were never localized, you know. <clears throat> and of course you had the profundities of, of a guy called uh, Noam Chomsky lagging his stuff out there, you know. All this is uh, things that we, we, we lived on, we consumed and we... Um, but over time, not that I... Over time you realize actually Things are changing at another level. 
and other factors come into play, which is a long-term living condition, not, a, not the immediate, it's a longer vision that occurs. And for that, another kind of thought process is required. You know, ours was immediate. And that's when, and that's when, that's why poetry. Yeah. That's why poetry is so critical. You know, and uh, a vision of time and change and uh, not to expect it to happen tomorrow morning, but to see it as a flow. And uh, if one can hasten the flow a little, nothing like it, yeah. you know, but stop trying to stop it. Yeah. That's the problem. Look at the work of Flavia. Will she change the legal system? She can't. But she's taking steps. And there are people like her who are doing work. But there are steps being taken. But can she change the whole structure of the system? Well, these are steps which are important, I think. So in that, level, in that way, I think it's important that, you know, Jobs can, can be done which shift, you know, uh, of course a little here, a little there, a little movement here. Yeah. But you're saying also that because of the time then and the political context, it was possible to have this kind of very idealistic notion of filmmaking. And yeah. right now that kind of notion of uh, whatever you call it, political filmmaking, parallel filmmaking is no, I think it's possible provided, provided somebody understands that it's not, you aren't making a political film because it's the way you, it's your personal faith. If it can be seen that it is also the faith of a lot of people across the land. Once it's, once it's seen like that, and political scene, cinema needn't be agit profit, needn't be, needn't be these, the shouting of slogans and things, no, it needn't be that, but it can be a far more, uh, encompassing vision, you know, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, narrowness, narrowness of view, I think, uh, uh, or the, or the, or the, that, that, uh, you know, the, um, beam, in terms of a vision, I think uh, is over, it should be a little more spread out and open up. And uh, again, that's what poetry is all about, isn't it? It spreads itself out across. You know, it's like it wafts in the breeze, and it touches the corner, it touches somebody here, it touches, and all different kinds of people it touches, and that's important to tap that. Do you think anybody is being able to do that? No. I haven't seen too many films, but in terms of books, yes, and novels, of course, they are the right, wonderful writers. I think um, if one takes Indian, at least in writing in English, mm -hmm. you take the work of, say, uh, an Amitabh Ghosh, yes. he reaches somewhere. You can, see, you can sense he's trying, he's trying very hard. He's, he is mm -hmm. provoking a thought process, and that's important, you know. And like I said, and now he's not that he's going to change the entire state. He can never overtake it. The Jeffrey Archers are going to rule. I mean, the guys like, you know, the other clown, uh, you know, I don't know whoever they are. But, yeah. and Amitabh Ghosh is good for the, I think, sanity of, of people. The fact that he is allowed to write yeah. and create, and uh, that's important. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, I'm talking about in India, but I, I'm sure there are writers in, 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 in Marathi and in Gujarati and in Bengali and in Tamil, I'm sure there are writers, because I remember reading translations when I was a young boy of, of Manik Bandapadai and, uh, and uh, 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 the translation of Namdev Dasar and, uh, and um, uh, Mulgankar. Now, I, there, there was a quality to it. I haven't kept in touch of late, recently, with writings in India or in the languages, but Devi Prasad Chattopadhyay. God, his, his, uh, look, I, what a document, what a document. But, like I said, of, of late I have not been reading. I wanted to 
basically ask you about, we've been talking about film, but specifically the role of the documentary in, in India, I guess, in post colonial India generally. Is that, you know, like I, I, I think the role of the documentary is critical. Provided it's not state-sponsored, you know, there's a problem. Okay, lots of documentary being made on Kashmir, backed by the government of India. You know, lots of documentary being made on on uh, on development, backed by the you know various ministries. Yeah. But I think the independent documentary filmmakers, I think it's it's their job. Well, the only problem that occurs with their work, I feel, is where is it shown? I've seen some wonderful documentaries made by wonderful young people. Why isn't there a platform for them to show their work and where is the platform? And that space has been removed. <coughs> was it ever there? At one point there, it was there. It was there in Doodarshan. What I gather, there's a program, I don't know whether it still exists, on Doodarshan, uh, the chap, Kya naam is ka? Merotra, Rajiv, Rajiv Merotra. What does it call that thing? It's open frame. Open frame. Yeah, but you know, uh, maybe that is serving some purpose. But from what I, what I gather, it's very pretty late in the night. It's 9:30 in the night, and then 9:00 uh, in the morning. Saturday. Yeah. Friday. Saturday. So, yeah. I mean, there is a role. I, I suppose that the people who are seeing it are the people who don't really matter in the scheme of things. And the people who are seeing it, you know, if they are being affected by what they are seeing, I think that's a good thing. Maybe they're not in upper class salons, they're not in upper class homes. It doesn't matter, but if that is some kind of a platform being provided. You mean I think it's, TV yeah, let's hope, let's hope. Uh, I'm not painting a dead-end picture, I'm not, I hope I'm not painting a dead-end vision of, you know, of, uh, not just India, it's, a, it's of a world, you know. It's not just India that I'm talking about. It's just... Uh, we have perceived development in a certain kind of way and all financial and other efforts go into perceiving it in that way and therefore development occurs in some form or the other. But like I tried to say it in my book that you know a certain kind of question leads to a certain kind of answer then to a corresponding question. It's continuous. The point is to question the question. What do we perceive as development? What do we perceive as human development? What do we perceive as human dignity? What is it? And if that can change, and we've paid a terrible price. I mean, the world has paid a terrible price with this development. It's, it's, it's rampaging across the world. It's rampant. It's rapacious. It's, it destroys. It destroys the human being. And, uh, and we think that's progress. You know, look at this. You know, you actually have to see the faces of people on, in New York. It will blow your mind. And that's what we are aspiring for. He's quit and he's run. It's good. <laughs> you know, because it's, it, you've got to see the faces and then you realize, just with those faces are those billboards. You look at the billboard. Wow, what a life. Look below. That's the street. Yeah. And in buses and cars on the street, you just see the faces. It's stressed out. Yeah. Is that what the human being is all about? And this is what the entire bloody world is aspiring for. I love and why? Well, caps wrapped across the nose on your head and uh, uh, the big apple, uh, your man. And yeah, come on, my friend. Give me a big. You see a reality. It's there. And then you see it revealed in that, uh, when the uh, typhoon hit um, uh, New Orleans, Katrina. Suddenly saw so in America, woof. And America today says that 20% of its citizens are poor. 20%. It 
Imagine, imagine India now. Twenty percent are poor. That's a hell of a lot of people. This is where we're heading. Nobody seems to realize, including, including Mr. Manmohan Singh and Montek Singh, uh, Luwalia and all, with Chidambar. Chidambar, I love him. I love his stashed white kurta. What a guy. I mean, there doesn't seem to be another idea of development, really. There is no, there is no alternative. And the, the point is that we put our eggs in the, the, We had no choice because we didn't deliver earlier in our so-called socialist, so-called socialist, secular democracy, whatever that we are supposed to, to have been. So now, boom, we've gone this way. And we actually believe it's going to happen. Look at the turmoil in Europe. Look at the turmoil in Europe which has followed that path. Look at the turmoil in, in America that has followed. What is Obama standing for? Besides what is the speech that he made yesterday. Jane, what are they talking about? What was this? The young people who were supporting this man were, were, I think, they had a vision of poetry in their mind somewhere. Well, look where he ended up actually, unfortunately. But they, I'm sure they were fighting for a poetic vision of a world. That's what they were, wanted this man for. And he talked about that. And they held his arm and said, we are with you. Poetry. Bringing back poetry. And he gave them the idea of poetry. Well, those backroom boys are eliminated, those lobbies are eliminated. Well, look where you end up, unfortunately. But, that's the dream that he gave to the American people. And the young people backed him up, those young people, that is the young, across color, across race, across I don't know what. And they backed this man. Am I right? But didn't he, didn't he bring in poetry? Well, that's what they wanted. UNICEF. I don't know why they called me. And they called me and they said, Mr. Mirza, we'd like you to make a comment on uh, education on the child in India. I said, fine, I'll do it. And they said, but you, Mr. Mirza, you know, there's a book that you have to read, written by a fellow called Myron Wiener. I said, why do you want me to read, me to, me to read, to read this book? This is not because that's the, the view of UNICEF. I said, I'm not going to read it. Uh, if my views match his through the film that I make, wonderful. If it doesn't, that's the way it's going to be. Now, this was for a SARC conference that is occurring. So I said, I'm not going to be bound by that book. So they find this measure. Since they come here, you couldn't back out now. It's probably too late for them. So, and they hoped like hell that it would match the book. Whatever they could have to say. So I made the film. And they had no choice but to screen it. And when they screened it with the title saying that the views of the director don't necessarily match those of UNICEF. I said, fine, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. That documentary that I made, just to the people of India, they didn't like it. Everybody else was thing was screened at 9.30 in the very night. I was screened at 11.30. You know why? They didn't like what I had to say about India and the 50 years of independence. 11.30 in the bloody night, they screened my bloody documentary, my, my episodes. They didn't like it. Say, yeah, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you I said, yeah, that's not the point. What do you expect? Genuflection? What do you expect? On your knees, you start groveling because you've given the cash. And I'm not suggesting that I have the truth. It's not. And within that, I've also questioned my own questions within that, those parameters. But that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And so that's the only way to make it, a documentary. But then, uh, the secretary, whoever it was who called us up, he liked it, it liked very much. I'm so sorry, sir, but that's the way it is. They're going to screen his stuff at 11.30 in the night. But, thank you very much for doing that work. But it's tough. It's tough because even when you get funds from abroad, you have to question there again, does. 
And if you get funds from the government, when you question their bloody agendas, you know, it's, it's tough. But somewhere in between you find a balance and you do your stuff and you do it with, with I think with a, with, a, with, a, with a conviction and that to me is important. And then you battle it out, it's a, in a sense, it's a, I don't mean battle, but you've got to explain across your point of view across to somebody who's put the money away, what do you expect me to do? To be a court jester? What do you want me to do? Be a bhand? I'm not that. Or call somebody else who will deliver it for you. Don't call me. And if you know my track record, that's the way I am. These jute are the ones. Have you seen these jute? No, hold on, hold on, let me explain this to you. It goes up at the back also, I must tell you. Why did this jute come in? This design is approximately 1400 years old. Yeah. Why do I wear these shoes? It's the only shoes that I have. And I've got four or five pairs of them. That's it. These shoes are the worn, this design. The Wong's wife was some wonderful people in the world. And I think they, they changed the course of history and they changed the world, the way the world he thought. They mentioned in my book, Ibn Sena and Ibn Rushd. Why the shoes? Just to give me a sense of grounding, a sense of belonging with history. Where did you get them? Morocco. But I'm getting them done over here at Mahabdeshwar. Karwaram. <laughs> Just, it's not, it's nothing much. It's not, I'm not trying to make a point. But these, they were, they, they were alternative thinkers. And they were dismissed. They were dismissed. Deliberately. They are the guys who brought Arya Bhatt, Bhatt and Brahmagupta to the West, they brought in Chinese medicine and, and, and the, the decimal system and the zero from India and they brought it into, into the West. These are the guys, they brought in Aristotle and Plato and they brought in bloody uh, uh, Ptolemy and they brought in, they discussed the world. And they were wondering where the hell are we heading? And what is science for? What is it all about? Good guys. Chalo, Khoda Hafiz. God be with you guys. And since there is no God, be with us.